TRX-50 is the desktop class, high-end desktop, for Threadripper. So Threadripper and Threadripper Pro are opening up simultaneously. <laughs> AMD is growing, they're becoming stronger. This video is focused on TRX-50, but be aware that there is the WRX-90 platform, which is Threadripper Pro, and workstations are launching from companies like Falcon Northwest that are based around the Threadripper Pro processor. But this, this is TRX-50. This is the TRX-50 Sage Wi-Fi. A little bit surprised that Asus didn't continue their Sapphire Rapids Ace versus Sage naming convention because with Sapphire Rapids, there's a four channel memory version, which is the Asus Ace, and there's the Asus Sage, which is the eight memory channel version, but this is the Sage and it's four memory channels. This motherboard is built for power delivery. Lots and lots and lots of power delivery. So much power delivery, it's crazy. Almost, but not entirely, PCI Express 5. Most of the slots are PCI Express 5, except for the bottom two. The bottom two slots here are Gen 4. So no hackery like buying an extra, extra, extra large case and hanging your GPU off the bottom so you get full use of all of the other PCIe slots. Kind of makes sense, TRX-50. You don't want the board to be absurdly expensive with redrivers and everything else. I get it. But you are PCI Express 5 for your M.2 and your PCIe slots. This motherboard is unusual in that it supports dual power supply. If you're gonna go the dual power supply route, make sure you've got a case that supports dual power supply, but also make sure that the power supplies are matched. You should not use dual power supplies unless you're planning to overclock, in which case dual power supplies is fine. The gray slots are the primary ones. There's little plastic tabs inserted in the ones that you're not supposed to use unless you do second power supply, so just be aware of that. There's also auxiliary power inputs for power hungry PCIe devices. This is handy if you're running multiple GPUs, something like that. The board layout here is, is pretty comprehensive. There's USB type C, a multiplicity of four pin fan headers, two USB 2.0 headers, an RS-232 serial header, uh, the normal front panel case connections, TPM header, you got four SATA at the front, a 20 pin USB five gigabit header, you got a slim SAS connection, which you can use for SATA or PCI Express. For a rear I.O., it's pretty similar to what we've seen from higher end platforms this time around. Uh, gone are the days of 7.1 analog audio. We've got analog out and microphone in, but we do maintain that optical SPDIF connection. We've got three banks of 10 gigabit type A ports, two 2.0 USB ports, one of which is BIOS flashback, which is important for future USB support, and a 20 gig USB port. No USB 4 here on this motherboard. We've also got our BIOS flashback button and our clear CMOS button. There's also a Wi-Fi 6E solution that's built right in. Let's detour for a second to talk about memory. These are RDIMMs, it's RDIMMs up and down the stack. Some people might look at that and say, I really would have liked to have had desktop class memory on the TRX-50. As an enthusiast, I'm going to say no. But as someone trying to put myself in your position, I'm also going to say no. And the reasons kind of overlap, but they're also kind of different. You see, DDR5 desktop memory and DDR5 server memory uh, are products that have different design goals. Desktop DDR5 memory is all about cost minimization and bringing up DDR5 on a desktop, desktop platform. It has been really difficult to achieve things like uh, two DIMMs per channel and making sure the two DIMMs per channel are going to be able to run at those upper echelons of what DDR5 is beginning to offer us. Two DIMMs per channel early in the DDR5 lifetime made sense when the fastest DDR5 memory you could get was 4800, 5200, 5600. But now we're entering an era where DDR5 is 6000, 7000, 8000 and beyond. And while the latency is not really improving because the circuit is, you know, we've got some speed of light problems, the speed of light's not getting any faster. The transfer rate and the clock speed, those are going up and that, that really helps us. When the companies that make the memory ICs are doing the bring up and they're doing the engineering, they're doing it from a server perspective in terms of volume of memory chips. Most of those are going into the server platforms first and the server platforms have the margins. The mass market stuff doesn't have nearly the margin, generally, as server products. And so the server products tend to be the most debugged, the most quickly. So in using DDR5 on you know, Team Red or Team Blue, bringing it up a little rough around the edges, whereas DDR5 in server platforms, even on workstation platforms that support DDR5 overclocking, I'm speaking specifically about Intel's Sapphire Rapids platform, 
It was a dream. It was basically plug and play. And that's the same experience with TRX-50 for memory. So if you don't want any memory headaches and you want your memory to run at some ludicrous speed, you're probably better off with a TRX-50 platform. That said, DDR5-5200 is the officially supported speed from AMD. Do keep that in mind. But AMD has got best in class memory latencies with registered error correcting DDR5. In fact, I don't know how they're doing this without vCache or some kind of other trickery. Anyway, let's put together a system. Oh, we're gonna need a case to put all this in, and at least one power supply, at least one for now. We're gonna put it in a Lee and Lee 011 Dynamic because it supports two power supplies. Softer power! For the cooling, we're gonna use the NZXT Kraken 360. Why? Because this is an Asetek cooler enhanced and augmented by NZXT, whatever that means. And also, this bracket, which is bundled with the CPU. This is basically the same for the last few generations of Threadripper. And so this bolts on that, and then this cools the CPU. We're gonna try that and see how that goes. And don't worry, I'm gonna have coverage of other CPU coolers as well. If you're dead set against AIOs, the Arctic Freezer 4UM. This is a competent cooler that will get the job done. Not gonna have a ton of overclocking headroom, but this is one of the best coolers for this socket that you can get right now, period. And it has the correct front to back orientation. AMD has the absolute friendliest DIY installation mechanism. There's a cover, a latch thing. There's a plastic sled and there's a protector for your socket. So you can slide out the plastic thing, slide in your CPU, and then you can remove the protective cover from the socket. There it is. I ended up using the Be Quiet Dark Base 13 80 plus titanium for my power supply. Built in PCIe 5 connectors so I could use an NVIDIA graphics card or whatever. 850 watts is a little on the anemic side if I'm going to overclock, but if I add two of them, that's 1700 watts. And you get around the North American lack of foresight problem because we have 15 or 20 amp breakers here in North America, which is you know, on the order of 1500 watts, give or take, and actually with RMS and the 80% load, continuous, whatever. You don't want to have a circuit fully loaded, but with two power supplies, you can plug into two different circuits in your house. People with 220 volts don't have this problem. Well, here we are just a couple of weeks after launch, and I have been through everything with my ASUS Sage TRX50 motherboard since launch. And it's holding up really well. 32 cores, 64 cores, 96 cores. I'm also very impressed to learn that Falcon Northwest, that's their go-to board for their TRX-50 based systems. And if you didn't see my review of their rack system, you should check that out because it features the ASUS TRX-50 motherboard. Now back here, I'm running a 96 core solution on ComSol. I'm experimenting with processor groups, which is not the same thing as NUMA nodes under Windows. And it turns out the perfect split for the 96 core is this weird NUMA setup where you have 64 threads per node and three nodes. At that point, everything is pretty balanced, but it's pretty tricky to get that configuration. I really only have two complaints about the TRX-50. One, there's no breakout headers or anything to give you external PCIe Gen 5 connections other than the PCIe slots. I mean, yeah, it's got the M.2. We do have the M.2 cheat code option where we can throw something in an M.2 slot and pull those Gen 5 lanes out of the M.2. But uh, Asus's competitors seem to have all embraced headers or connectors or other stuff that gives you features or access to the Gen 5 features on the board. The other thing is memory. So I've gone back and forth between the Enthusiast DDR5-6000 registered error correcting memory and server grade, server set spec, JEDEC DDR5-4800 memory. This motherboard is really temperamental about moving back and forth between 512 gigabytes of memory, which is 128 gigabytes per DIMM. Those are very expensive DIMMs. And gamer memory, and right now I'm running a 256 gigabyte configuration, which is 64 gigabytes per DIMM. In all scenarios, I pretty much have to clear the CMOS or take all the memory out and just put in one DIMM, and the training still takes a very long time. So if you go through that, don't let that be unsettling. Part of that is just the DDR5 like initial training and subsequent trainings are actually really quick. But when you change the memory configuration, don't be surprised if your machine doesn't post for like 30 minutes. You may actually have to use that clear CMOS button. You may actually have to do other stuff in order to get it to go. In terms of testing CXL devices, well, as far as I can tell, CXL devices are pretty well supported on the Intel workstation platform. 
I'm surprised there hasn't been a BIOS update or platform update or anything else for the TRX50, given that it's been a couple of weeks now, well, almost a month now since launch from ASUS. They have issued a firmware update for the USB 4x4 controller, that's the 20 gigabit controller to improve USB connectivity with different uh, 2 by 10 gigabit connection USB devices, which I sort of expected they might do that. And it's nice to see ASUS coming out the gate with that kind of support because people are using this board for lots of connectivity. I'm still testing Thunderbolt. Well, okay, PCIe tunneling. It's an add-in Intel uh, Thunderbolt chipset, which enables a Thunderbolt-like, but not quite Thunderbolt functionality on the platform to be able to connect PCIe tunneling USB devices to the platform. Yeah, it's got the header for it and you can, you can get it done but that's gonna be a video for another day. And what this is level one, be sure to check out my other TRX50 videos. Bottom line, the ASUS Sage TRX50, it's got the best power delivery of any TRX50 motherboard if you're gonna dump north of a kilowatt into your CPU. But for everyday usage, it's pretty good. Overkill, if anything. I uh, wish they would uh, add some more stuff to the BIOS and everything else, but ASUS, so far so good. I'm Wendellis Level 1, I'm signing out, you can find me in the Level 1 forums.